Um, the two trends that I've seen in uh, in housing as a result of the pandemic, um, the first is a kind of, uh, I think, myth about the death of the city. You have a lot of people writing about how they want to move to the countryside or even mm-hmm. suburbia and uh, buy houses with gardens and things like this. Um, But I think that this will not really last as a trend, mainly because if you're over 40 and have an established career, or if you uh, um, work in a sector which can easily um, be moved online, then maybe it's okay. But the reality is that if you're 16 or 17, finishing high school, or perhaps just graduating from university, Mm -hmm. and you want to start your career and understand more about yourself, you really, it's hard to do that if you're not in the city. Um, you have to meet people physically, you have to build relationships, Absolutely. you have to experience culture in a different way. So I, I don't anticipate that uh, cities are on the decline in any way. Um, and then the other trend, of course, is it's kind of strange. One of the things I've wanted to review for many years has been the IKEA home office uh, furniture offering. Mm. Uh, the, the, the concept of the home office basically hasn't changed in 20 years. Uh, it's, and what the way that I explained that previously was that uh, the whole home had become an office. So I think the idea of having your kind of family PC in a sort of special piece of bookcase furniture in the living room and that's room, where yeah. you do your uh, home, uh, home working uh, I, I don't think you know is true anymore I can have my laptop on my knees in bed and perfectly happily work mm. there for half a day but nonetheless it does mean that people are now for uh, kind of reasons often to do with um, the need for quiet or uh, sound isolation are starting to rethink what it means to have a home office. And I think in that sense, what it does to the future of of apartment layouts, of the way we think about spaces within the home could be quite interesting. Mm, I mean, it's an interesting one about the city because um, I mean, obviously the city feels quite dead at the moment. And there was a a recent news of like 300,000 people leaving London. Did you Mm. see that? No, I didn't, but I will definitely look that up. That sounds right. Yeah, it feels like, it does feel like, maybe it feels like even more people have left, I guess, if you, um, when you walk around. Um, but there is this kind of emphasis on the domesticity, or even on, on many levels, like from, from the kind of clothes that's being purchased to, um, to just this kind of, you know, bookcases that are behind us, or like, you know, kind of framing the views for the Zoom uh, conversations and things like that. Yeah, I I don't think that people, I don't think that society as a whole has paid this much attention to domestic space, probably Mm. ever, certainly never in my lifetime. And people on the whole are now uh, much, much more aware of their domestic situation uh, Mm. than they were uh, before the pandemic just as a product of spending a lot more time at home Mm. and having also to introduce other types of activities to the home. Um, Mm. And so particularly homes or houses or apartments, which are designed pretty much as places to sleep and make a meal uh, in between going to an office or in between going to work, these ones become very quickly uh, apparent uh, that they're not really suited to uh, you know, long-term life. Um, I think a lot of people, both in their domestic uh, condition and often in their kind of work or, or family relations, the pandemic has also caused uh, um, a great period of reflection in which there's a lot of um, uh, discussion and reflection on what people want to do with their lives, whether they think their lives are the best that they could be, um, and whether they're living where they want to be, whether they're really, uh, it, I think it's, it's been a kind of reassessment of different values as well. Mm. I've seen a lot of people who uh, used to live for their career and live for their work suddenly decide that actually being closer to their family is more important, for example. 
Mm. Um, in my case, uh, before the pandemic, I was traveling to France uh, pretty much every week or every other week in order to spend time with my wife who lives there. And she was coming back the other way. And this meant that I spent, you know, five days apart from her and just saw her at the weekends. And we'd been doing that for two years. And it wasn't until the pandemic came and we were together for, you know, three, four plus months that I realized how uh, unhappy I was actually about uh, traveling back and forward and being separated from mm. her. So, you know, one of the biggest consequences is that we're not going to live apart anymore. And that, of course, requires completely changing our work set up our home set up mm. it's quite a significant change um but in terms of the level of domesticity itself yeah I, I do think that uh um there there are a lot of positives that can come from people paying close attention to uh domestic sphere i think one of the downsides is that it is also mm, made more extreme the inequalities that were already present before yes. Uh, yes, that's a big point that's a good point and whether or not that becomes addressed by society as we exit the pandemic is an, is i think another question because for some of us um that are not in extreme domestic environments where there is a you know five children in a two-bedroom flat um it's kind of a you know finding a new way of life but for some people it's really a kind of um torturous um uh, quite a um, um, difficult situation, I guess. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, particularly for families and particularly for women in families uh, who have often had to take on um, their work, uh, their domestic labor, and often education for children as well. It becomes a kind of triple job. Uh, I agree with you that the absence of space is often a big problem. And, and another really big issue of the pandemic which I don't hear spoken about that much, but which I know is a very, very significant problem is domestic abuse uh, mm. as a consequence of people not being able to leave the home. So I think all of the kind of inequalities that were present in society before, uh, gender inequalities, class inequalities, wealth inequalities, uh, these are in a way being um, magnified mm. by the pandemic. There's also something interesting about the public space, because in those um, environments where the um, domestic space is so um, dense, uh, the public space was the kind of buffer zone, you know, a lot of the uh, community, poor, poorer communities were able to kind of use the public space as a space for a, a vent, in a way. So this is also somehow examining the role of public space. Mm. The changing yeah, role, or... I, I mean, uh, I think I have two things to say about that. The first is that, of course, uh, what you say is completely right, which is why I think um, certainly in Britain, we, we developed the idea of the pub, which is the public, I mean, the mm. public house. Um, and the concept of a public house is basically that like a church, there would be one almost on every street. And uh, you didn't have necessarily the space within your own house to um, to relax or to socialize. Uh, you couldn't invite people around to your place easily because it wasn't big mm. enough. So mm. the, the public house served a very important role. Now we think of pubs as just being a place to drink, but of course, uh, for most of their history, pubs have also uh, welcomed families and, and had many other types of programs involved in them as well. And so I think it, the decline of the public house is, is definitely uh, closely tied up with, with some of these issues. But to be more direct about this problem, of, public space. One of the things that I'm writing about at the moment is the decline of the public sphere generally uh, and trying to work out or trying to explain why that might be. Um, Jürgen Habermas has a fantastic book about the emergence and invention of the public sphere. He says that the public sphere um, it used to be uh, not it, you you didn't used to be able to separate the public sphere from the state and what he means by that is like the only people who could have opinions about politics or about state affairs uh, were people who were attached to the royal courts uh, mm -hmm. and you know they were the people who lived at Versailles they were the people who surrounded the king in Britain and so on um, the idea that uh, you know 
a peasant or even something like a regional doctor could have an opinion about, uh, you know, the military affairs of Britain in the 1600s uh, was quite uh, hard because there was not a lot of information and it was tightly controlled and they were not expected or um, uh, or allowed to have opinions about this. And Habermas then says that the invention of the coffee house and the invention of the newspaper were central to basically creating the possibility for discussion, dialogue, exchange, um, in a place and also uh, between places using these technologies, which created what you would call like public opinion. And once you have a concept of public opinion, the relationship with power in the state changes a lot. You know, once the people, let's say, start to have opinions about how the state should be governed, what it should be doing, um, what their needs are, and they're able to communicate with each other, then the idea of uh, you know, a government which rules absolutely becomes very difficult. The government doesn't just have to go through an election, it has to also continue to have the um, confidence of the people. And certainly in totalitarian or authoritarian regimes that look like democracies, uh, you know, I might point to um, Burma or Thailand, for example, um, as, uh, you know, in the case of Burma, you have elections every, I think, five or six years, um, but the conditions under which they're held mean that no one, there is no public sphere. You cannot mm. have a public opinion, which is separate from the military. Um, and of course, in Europe, we've enjoyed for now many centuries the idea of a very free public sphere. And the public sphere, in a sense, also spans a number of other spheres. Uh, it connects what you might talk about at home, the domestic sphere, with also what, what you might talk about at work or what is happening at your work. Um, but the public sphere is also not a commercial uh, realm, is what uh, Habermas says, that it's not, um, it's not a marketplace. Uh, it's not about a commercial transaction or buying or selling something. It's really about philosophy, poetry, social issues, politics, things which concern human life as a whole. And I think one of the real difficulties that we've seen before the pandemic, um, I would put it behind, for example, the rise of Trump or the, or the effects of the uh, Brexit vote. These are the consequences of not having a, a functional uh, public sphere. And one of the things which I found most difficult about the pandemic is that public life is completely suspended. Um, you no longer have the ability to discuss or exchange ideas about how the state should be governed, about how society, what the needs of society are uh, in a kind of collective or public way. Um, and that's partly tied up to, you know, not being able to enter into public space. Uh, but it also has to do with just the ways in which we communicate uh, before the pandemic, which is mainly social media, which is a completely privatized and uh, commercial uh, uh, form. It's not a it's not even like a newspaper, uh, social media, because the content is so targeted um, that there is no uh, general discussion. Yeah. Uh, so that's that, my, it's my, my not algorithm. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, even in a newspaper where there are commercial aspects like adverts, everyone sees the same advert. Uh, which is not the case on social media. Yeah. Um, and of course, in a newspaper, everyone reads the same article, um, which is also part of then creating a secondary discussion, uh, which is not the case today. And I mean, th maybe just to conclude on that kind of question of publicness, the, the final thing about being confined to the home in relation to public space is that uh, we used to have um, quite a complex uh, social relationship with other people that wasn't just um, what we have at the moment, which is I'm in communication with my family and perhaps the top three or four of my best friends. Beyond that, I have very little contact with even quite good friends, certainly with like loose friends or friends who live at a distance. I have no contact at all with what I would call acquaintances or people who I like, but who I am not in daily contact with or close contact with normally, or colleagues, people who I like fine, but who I work with perhaps, who are not necessarily part of my immediate uh, friend uh, group. So this probably encompasses, I tried to calculate it, 
on, on an, in a normal week, I, I would normally come into contact with and have conversations with something like 200 people. Um, and now it's the same four or five people that I've been speaking to pretty much uh, without exception um, mm. for more than a year. And, and the damage that that does then to how society sees itself and how we engage with people who are like us, not like us, uh, I think that's very worrying effect of the pandemic. I think quantifying it like that. No, no, no. But I think quantifying it like that, it really hits the nail on the head because it, it um, I think there is, I guess, the third space that we can talk about is the digital space where we say that there are so many opportunities and it's, well, democratic to, to an extent. Uh, but the consequence of it being exactly what you've just said, that uh, it, it reduces your um, circle of um, uh, people you communicate to, to, to a very low number. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if the digital space is the kind of third kind of space that is being stress tested uh, in the past year. Um, do, you, do you see any opportunity in um. I, well, I guess the first thing to say is that um, I try to be sensitive to trends uh, and I take trends very seriously because mm -hmm. I, I see them as almost being like uh, psychological therapy for society. You know, what people mm -hmm. are, are fascinated by at the moment often tells you a lot about what's going on behind uh, their... Um, behind Subconscious. Their, exactly. Yeah. Um, and what I've noticed is two things. One is that amongst the students that I teach, and I've seen a number of articles pop up online in that people are, uh, seem to be struggling more with lockdown three than they were with lockdown one or two, that the levels of mental health are much poorer and that people are, uh, um, feeling much more stressed and depressed, partly, uh, according to an article in the new statesman I read. Uh, that um, it has to do with um, not really believing in a future or not having a sense of future and beginning to realize that this is going to be something which lasts for a very long time and that it's not clear what the end is. Um, that uh, article uh, also uh, reinforces something that an Austrian friend of mine said. She's a journalist who interviewed a, um, a therapist who was saying that uh, one of the best things you can do during the pandemic is to constantly talk about the future, not in concrete terms as a plan, because a plan obviously is very difficult to do at the moment, but to keep uh, some fixation on um, things that you would like to do. So, for example, I now speak frequently about, you know, I'm looking forward to going swimming in the sea. I'm looking forward to going to a bar. Mm. I'm looking forward to uh, going to a restaurant with my friends. Um, and that idea of looking forward, I think, is, is quite important at the moment. Uh, what I have also seen is a lot of people online, uh, on a daily basis, I see Instagram stories and Instagram posts complaining about the adverts on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, the, the kind of dislike of Instagram ads, which is definitely, uh, I think, a sign of, um, yes, people are bored with ads, but also... Uh, people are bored with the internet. They don't want to watch more Netflix. They don't want to spend more time on their phone. They have kind of reached a saturation point with that. Uh, it's not an exciting or uh, uh, interesting place to be. It's, again, just the same repetitive material going round and round. Um, and uh, so I think the, the consequence of this could also be, uh, you know, they say that if you want to prevent children well, this is a very old fashioned technique, but uh, often children uh, who were uh, discouraged from smoking by being forced to smoke an entire pack of cigarettes. Uh, this is a kind of 20th century uh, punishment to prevent kids from smoking. And uh, I would say that having spent so much time on Netflix and so much time on our phones, uh, as soon as we are able, people will I think strike a very different relationship with digital space. Um, and perhaps in recent years, real life was an extension of the internet um, in as much as the digital world had completely come to dominate our relationship with reality. 
I'm hoping that after the pandemic, uh, the digital world will again become an extension of real life. Um, and I'm expecting as well, a lot like the 1920s, once the pandemic is under control, people will have a great joy for life. They will probably have a huge amount of energy and desire to be in contact with each other, um, which will mean, of course, uh, you know, a lot more parties, but also uh, a lot of um, uh, kind of anticipation or desire to do things quickly. Um, and so I'm expecting there to be, you know, quite a serious cultural boom after the pandemic, assuming that, um, yeah, assuming that it does end in a way that previous pandemics have ended. Um, mm. um, so if you, um, I guess now, if you talk, if you talk about your work, and if we try to kind yeah. of uh, look back at what you've done pre-pandemic, and um, a lot of it was to challenge the domestic space or to kind of examine the idea of the domestic space or or just living space in general. I'm just wondering if there were particular moments that you feel would look very different uh, in terms of your output. So if you were to re-examine, um, you know, the Venice Biennale curation, for example, do you think, um, um, do you think it would look a lot different uh, now? I think if I were thinking about the Biennale uh, and doing the same show in a post-pandemic world, nothing about that has fundamentally changed, except perhaps uh, one aspect, which is that the British uh, pavilion at the 2016 Biennale was the first exhibition that we could find that looked at uh, occupation of architecture through uh, time categories. Uh, so normally architecture is presented through typologies um, or through you know, different types of buildings or through different uh, conditions like urban and rural. Um, we had never been able to find, uh, well, that's not true actually. Someone told us that there was an exhibition held in 1916 in Czechoslovakia but they couldn't find any material on it. So we are not sure if this is real or not. Okay. Uh, but, the, uh, but the idea of then looking at the home through different lenses and saying, what, let's not talk about building types. What does a home for days look like? What does a home for months look like? And how are they different from a home for decades in terms of our relationship with materiality, with space, with family structure, and, and with uh, what you could call homeliness, the feeling of being at home. And of course, the only thing that the pandemic has changed is that um, the idea of going somewhere for a few days is completely impossible. So the category of a home for days would have to be removed. Uh, uh, unless of course a home for days, I mean, probably you would end up looking at quarantine hotels, uh, you know, places where you have to spend 10 days um, in, uh, in total isolation because I have a few friends who have had to do these types of uh, hotel uh, stays and they are incredibly um, extreme experiences, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which has also given me, I have to say, a lot more um, understanding through what they've said about uh, solitary confinement in prisons and how extreme that is as a, a form of mental torture. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, apart from that, I, I don't think anything else that we discussed there has particularly changed. There's still a housing shortage. Uh, there's still uh, various inequalities in, in housing. I would say the stress would probably be different today, but the essence of it is, is fine. And, and the, the work that I've been doing in the years since then um, has, the pandemic has not uh, changed the work that I'm doing. In fact, if anything, actually, it, the, I've seen the greatest concrete steps forward uh, towards realizing my dreams uh, during the pandemic, um, which is unusual. Reinforced it in a way. Yeah, I think, I think also I was uniquely placed to take advantage of the pandemic mm -hmm. um, because I had a lot of privileges. Uh, one of those privileges was that my, most of my work could be done remotely. Uh, that I generally work in the creative and immaterial fields. So I was not required to be in, in an office or to be in a, in a factory. 
Um, I also don't have children, which meant that although the first, I mean, people talk about lockdown one with some nostalgia now. They're like, it was great. We were making sourdough bread. We had nothing to do. It was summertime and it was warm. For me, lockdown one was incredibly stressful because 80% of my company's income was completely erased uh, through the cultural projects that were cancelled and consultancy work that got stopped. So lockdown one was a very difficult period uh, for my business and for me. But once we managed to rebalance uh, our, let's say, approach towards work and find new sources of income, then um, the other conditions which I had, which was, you know, no children, the ability to work from home, and most of all, the, uh, as you were saying, the, the uh, habituation to working by myself, working in isolation, and also working from home, meant that, you know, in many ways, uh, the pandemic has been an extremely extended version of a normal week for me. Uh, of course, there's been some difficulties around my family's health and uh, around being able to see them or not being able to see them. And I've had friends who have been very ill and uh, as, as all of us have, um, but at a, at a basic level, you know, I don't have five children in a two bedroom apartment. And so in that sense, um, from my mental health standpoint, I had one week in October where I was like uh, very anxious and upset. Uh, but otherwise, I've been able to maintain quite a good level of productivity at a time when almost everything else has stopped. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And that's, I think, why um, I've, see, I've been able to advance the work that I'm doing uh, at a time when perhaps many other people are not able to. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of your practice at the moment, um, mm. how would you, I mean, I don't want to say how would you define it, but um, you're doing various things, you know, some of them as you say, not non-material, but there, there are also some material things. Um, you know, how do you, um, first of all, like grasp this variety of things that you're doing? Um, yeah, I think you're right to say that I'm doing diverse things, uh, mm -hmm. but they're all, they have always been very closely connected in my own mind. And it's only now that I'm able to express why I did those things in the order in which I did them. Um, the type of work that I do, of course, I, I have three main, uh, let's say, jobs or activities at the moment. The first is running Real Review, a uh, contemporary culture magazine. Um, the second is uh, Real Homes, which I'll come back to in a minute. And the third is teaching at the Architectural Association, uh, running a design um, studio. Uh, there are, of course, other things that I do in addition to that. We're publishing books. Uh, we have exhibitions which were completed in some of them in the end of 2019 that have been sitting in exhibition spaces waiting to be opened for more than a year. Uh, there's one that I'm expecting to open in maybe March or April in Vienna, which has literally been there for eight months um, gathering dust. So, uh, you know, of course I do a lot of other things in addition to that writing and so on. And the work that I've done in the past has seemed very eclectic. It ranges from doing art direction or creative direction for fashion brands uh, to, you know, consultancy work with uh, huge developers uh, of property and, um, you know, uh, brands like Ikea. Um, or uh, it has been um, cultural uh, work with uh, exhibitions or other types of uh, institutional uh, collaborations and publications, books, uh, and of course, a lot of writing. I was looking back on the writing that I've done in the last 10 years, and I had published about 500,000 words, which is about 50,000 a year. And I'd written 750,000 words, which is, I was quite surprised at, mm. at, at myself at how much I had been writing. Um, yeah. But of course, a lot of that was to do as well with how I earned money after I graduated, which was I didn't want to work for someone else. So I, um, I started trying to write to um, universities around Europe, not necessarily in the capital cities, but in the second cities. 
and uh, asking if I could come and give lectures uh, about subjects. Um, and then I would write uh, for, uh, you know, magazines a lot. And between the two of those, I was just about able to uh, make uh, ends meet. Um, but all of this seems very diverse, but actually if I'm very clear about the work that I'm doing now and why it is I'm, I've done what it is that I've done, um, Real Homes uh, is, has always been the ultimate ambition of Real Foundation, which is to produce low cost, high quality, uh, affordable, secure homes, which work using cooperative models of ownership. Uh, so it's a kind of, um, the, the idea of real homes is that uh, you pay rent, but it's, uh, it's quite low, it's, it's affordable for you, and you have a very high quality home, which is rent controlled, so it doesn't, uh, there are no rent hikes, you have a rolling annual contract like a mobile phone or Spotify, so you move in and you decide when you want to leave. Um, as we begin to have multiple buildings, it should be possible for you to put in an application to simply move from one building to another. Um, and then in addition to this, there is a share scheme where you can start to put aside money every month um, and that uh, to buy shares in the building that you live in. And those shares pay a dividend because everyone is paying rent. And as the building goes on over time, that dividend gets higher because you're paying off more and more of the cost of the building. Uh, but what that means is that uh, by the end of 30 years, in comparison with the normal mortgage, you will have made, uh, I think we worked out it was 350% more by doing this than if you had bought a traditional uh, house because of the cost of a mortgage, cost of maintenance and so on. So this is the proposal. And at the same time, the idea for real homes is to create the most diverse and inclusive housing on the planet, which means trying to address uh, structural inequalities of all kinds through uh, housing. And most of all, trying to present a vision of what a community for the 21st century looks like, a progressive, inclusive society. And in order to do this in incredibly difficult project, uh, it was necessary to become an expert in a lot of things. The first thing was I needed to understand how development works, how project finance works, and know a lot about the financial sector and investment uh, generally. Uh, then, of course, you also need to know how to design architecture, and you need to get very good at understanding efficiencies and um, you know the logic of how buildings go together, understanding everything from how structures operate to how to do mass uh, production or prefabrication, how to use uh, environmentally sustainable um, materials or reduce the carbon impact of your building. Uh, so I worked on that. Uh, then you also need to work out a way to communicate this to other people. Uh, so this is why I was interested in writing and in exhibitions, uh, in ideas of public communication. And then, of course, the idea of art direction and creative direction is also about how to uh, communicate effectively, how to make something which is seductive, how to draw someone into your vision or into your world that you're trying to create. So when you take it all together, uh, I'm now at the point where Real Homes has been launched. Uh, we have some seed funding in order to develop it into uh, a viable business model. Um, that business model is almost complete. The building, we've done a viability study for a building site in East London for a 20 story building with about 100 units in it. And um, all the numbers look good. We've had financial consultants looking at it. We qualify for social impact investment, which will be very uh, crucial for moving it forward. So I would say I am now closer to realizing real homes than I've ever been in the last 10 years. And a lot of the reason for that is that all the work I've been doing up until now has been necessary in order to get to the point where I can make a coherent, clear, compelling proposal. What you're saying is that the work you've done I mean, to, to a degree, it wasn't, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't deal with the technical details of buildings. I mean, it might have in some cases, but um, that wasn't the point. But it was like you were kind of directing this kind of perfect storm that would lead you to a kind of, um, well, a first project that would embody your ethos, I guess. 
Um, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, I And I've been very careful about how I've used my time in terms of what I do and what I don't do. And what I realized was if I concentrated on traditional architecture and that would never put me in a position in which I would be able to make these types of proposals. So I would perhaps know a lot more than I do about waterproof detailing or in fact, just the logic of how buildings uh, are assembled on site. Um, you know, I had that experience previously before studying at the Architectural Association. I worked for two years for Jean Nouvel as a landscape architect and on a 35 story uh, tower in, in Australia. And before that, I worked in private practice where I oversaw the construction of houses, small houses, and uh, other types of community centers and things like this. So I felt that um, I already had enough knowledge of how architecture worked before uh, starting this project of the last 10 years for me to focus on that. And I also thought a lot that having built work under my own name would not actually um, be an advantage in pu pushing forward this uh, this concept that I'm trying to develop. So, of course, it was a kind of a sacrifice because as an architect who loves architecture, I would love to make buildings. Um, but uh, and it was also a very high risk strategy because there's no guarantee even now that this will be possible or that this will be uh, yeah realistic, that it will actually happen. But I'm more confident now than I've been at any time in the last 10 years that given the path that I'm on, this is just a matter of time before it is uh, realized. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the framework that you've set up for yourself because, um, you know, you did set up a quite a tangible um, office or business structure, which is the foundation. And, uh, I've spoken to, as part of this series of conversations, I've spoken to many people from either from institutions or people that are almost uh, anti-institutional or uh, that describe institutions, uh, that describe um, this thing called institutional violence. Mm. Uh, so there's, there's various kinds of uh, views on, on the kind of roles of institutions in society, and we can mm. uh, talk about that. Uh, but you've kind of started your own in a way um, so I just wanted to kind of understand why did you think that was necessary and was it a response to a kind of um, to what we kind of see in a society in terms of institutional landscape? Um, the stunning point for the real foundation was basically that I wanted to start a practice that also had a very strong cultural uh, mission in terms of the work that I thought we would need to do, it's everything I've described, which is I wanted the ability to work equally across consultancy and art direction as across uh, architecture and design or cultural projects. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to, I had a, especially when I graduated, a very violent reaction against neoliberalism and against uh, precarious forms of employment and a very idealistic vision of which I maintain today actually. Uh, it's very hard to maintain ideology from when you are young through your life but this is one that I really feel very passionately about which is uh, you know I wanted to, to try and create the most ethical or most socially responsible form of architectural practice that I could think of. And so then the question for me was, you know, I could see how someone like Le Cabousier or even more recently Rem Koolhaas, they design themselves and they design their firms. This is the first design project they really do before they get to any buildings. You know, what do you want the figure of the architect to be in society and how will you design that? And what do you want the structure of your firm to be? Um, and so reflecting on that, I realized that we could not be a charity although we did make an application to be a charity, uh, we could not be a charity because uh, we didn't have a named benefactor. You know, charities have to be like for something, like for children that can't read or for, uh, you know, ducks in the Southeast of England. Um, and they asked us, who is your benefactor? And I said, society is our benefactor. That's who we work for. They are the people that we want to. And they said, that's, that's not a benefactor, that's everyone. 
So we couldn't become a charity. So then the next best thing was to become a foundation, which in the UK means that you're just a normal limited company, but that you have a series of uh, articles of association, um, which uh, force you to operate in a particular way. And in our case, we can only do projects that promote democracy, inclusivity, and equalities of many kinds amongst them, but not limited to gender, race, class, wealth, and space. And this was a way to prevent what I had seen a lot, which is people who have very good intentions. And then there is a kind of mission creep. They start to take on uh, work, which initially is at the edge of what they're interested in or at the edge of what they would accept. And then that leads to, you know, something which is even further from what it is that they're interested in doing. And then before you know it, they're doing something completely different from what they originally intended. Or even and, completely contradictory, something that facilitates the total opposite of what they stand for. You're absolutely right that actually, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, that one of the weirdest things is that so many people end up doing the exact opposite of what they set out to do. Um, and I'm very conscious of that. So, you know, it's possible that I will also accidentally do this. Um, I hope not. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, I think, why Real Foundation is established the way that it is, is to try and make sure that I don't lose focus or lose concentration. And this also is a form of resistance, because when you don't have much money, uh, as I didn't have then and haven't had for most of my adult life, um, you, you don't have a lot of security of your housing, of your uh, relationships, of your job. You don't have really much control over your time. Um, you are forced into other types of structures which have their own uh, pressures on them. And there's often, uh, at least in the work that I was doing, which was very precarious and very short-term uh, freelance work, you're constantly working on extremely short uh, deadlines or periods of time. You can only see perhaps two weeks or three weeks into the future. If you're lucky, you might get a job which has a two month or three month schedule to it, but even that is quite rare. And what that means is that you're constantly thinking about what you need today, what you need tomorrow. And within that framework, it's very difficult to think about 10 years, five years, uh, where I want to be in 30 years, what I'm trying to achieve with my career, or what I want to do with my life. These are not questions, these types of philosophical questions are not questions for people who are part of the precarious classes. Uh, they cannot think about the future in a meaningful way. Um, and I wanted to resist that. And so the Real Foundation is also an extreme structure because it really forced me to completely change my relationship with time and with my own work. But um, just, just on the point of institutions outside, uh, yeah. outside, of, your, uh, outside of Real Foundation, what, how do you see the kind of landscape? I mean, you do mm -hmm. collaborate with various institutions, but I'm just wondering yeah. if there is a kind of critical uh, yeah. response in the work that you do with your foundation. There is. I mean, it's a very, um, it's a very difficult relationship to have with both institutions and with companies. You know, how are we to understand doing a piece of consultancy work with IKEA, for example, which uh, you know, is a colossal company that has a huge impact on the planet? Or how are we to understand uh, you know, uh, doing, trying to collaborate with um, a cultural institution that you know has uh, no uh, people of color in any senior position um, or that has 80% of its board uh, plus uh, are ma male. Um, these become very difficult uh, conditions to, to know how to engage with because on the one hand, you can't be so ideologically pure that you work with no one. Um, then you really become isolated. Uh, and so if you frame yourself in constant opposition, you, you end up not being able to change those institutions either. Mm -hmm. So instead, our approach has generally been to try and work with other institutions as best we can, but to be very clear about the purpose of our project, which is these are the values that we support. We can only work with you if we can see that we will make an impact on your institution as well as on the audience. It's, it's, uh, it's not just about you know, trying to make like a good exhibition about social equality. We also have to be working with the institution themselves to advance those values within their own structure. And 
as part of that, we also always have uh, what we call a stop clause in our contracts, which is like, if things are going, if, if this contract or this collaboration or this work breaks the rules of what it is that we're doing, breaks the rules of our ambition, then we have the right to stop the contract, stop the work at any moment. Because I think a lot of the time as well, you start with the project and it looks like it has a lot of possibility, a lot of optimism, and the people involved seem quite good. And then by the time it comes to realization or the end of the project, all sorts of things have happened. It's become corrupted and manipulated and you end up doing something that you are not proud of and which in fact, as you say, potentially even does the worst or the opposite. And especially if you're someone who has strong moral values, you end up almost becoming like a, a piece of paper over the top of the institution that makes it look like they're doing something good, whereas in fact they're not. Uh, so that's why we insist that we have the ability to cancel at any moment and stop. But that in itself is also, it's an extreme position to take and that's, you know, it causes us many problems basically. Um, I would not recommend real foundation as a structure and I would not necessarily recommend it as a way of working because it is, uh, almost unnecessarily difficult to work mm -hmm. with. Um, but in turn, oh yeah, sorry. That will evolve? Will you, if, do you think you will, you will evolve it to, to, I don't know, adjust things that you think might be difficult or? Yeah, I mean, it's been a very slow growth with Real Foundation because we don't believe in unpaid labor, because we, uh, but, you know, we don't have interns, we, we don't have people who work for us for free. The people who work for us uh, are paid a uh, fair amount for their work. In fact, some of them are paid better uh, to work on things like Real Review than they would be to work on much more mainstream uh, magazines. And, but in order to get to that point, it means that, you know, because, because of those conditions, for the first five years of Real Foundation, I have exploited myself as a way to, in a way be a barrier between the reality of uh, contemporary capitalism and the type of community and ecosystem I'm trying to create within real foundation. And of course that's not sustainable in the long run for me to be this kind of- it's an investment. I think it is, I mean, but it's also, yeah. So we're reaching a point now, particularly with real review where it's grown big enough that we can start to have permanent staff um, and that's helping us then to be more productive, which in turn will help us to sell more magazines, which will allow us to professionalize more. Uh, in the case of real homes, you know, what, if we secure the amount of money that we're looking for, which is between 25 and $40 million, which is a huge amount of money, if we secure that to build our first building, then of course, everyone who comes to work for real homes from the beginning of that structure will be paid well, will have reasonable work hours, will have a uh, respectful, courteous uh, environment uh, to work, but also most of all, uh, will be part of this ambition to create uh, extreme inclusivity and extreme equality within the company. Um, and of course, in a way, in order to create that scenario, I've had to completely, you know, work myself ex in an extreme way for the last 10 years. And that's also why it's high risk because if it doesn't work, then uh, it will have been very disappointing for me. But yeah, so I think we are beginning to professionalize, um, but it is a very slow process because of my refusal to accept existing structures. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your um, work with other fields, which you've already mentioned, um, you know, in terms of working with fashion or, um, you know, big companies that do various other things, uh, being in conversation with arts and generally professions that are not architecture, um, what, where do you see the kind of real potential to learn from? Is it in the kind of a, uh, attitude? Is it in the mechanical approach to production of creativity? Where do you see that kind of... Uh, real uh, or do you obviously from each field you may be taking different different things but um. um yeah i mean every field i have specific reasons or um let's say it's i think of the work that i do in in the various fields that i've described uh mainly as a way to get experience it's part of a learning process for me um, so the only way that you can learn 
I mean, you know, there, there could be other fields that I could have worked in. For example, I've always been curious to work in advertising because I'm very interested by the way in which you convince someone to do something that they don't necessarily think they want to do. I mean, that's like an amazing skill to have, right? To be convincing. Yeah. Um, uh, but in the case of, you know, art direction or creative direction, creative direction is basically like commercial conceptual art. That's how I understand it today. If you look at some of the top creative directors, like, uh, I don't know, Virgil Abloh, Matthew Williams, Jonathan Anderson, Kim Jones, you know, all of the, all of them, uh, men, uh, but, uh, uh, if you look at these, uh, creative directors today, they are, um, uh, they're really working like conceptual artists. So they're, they're finding ways to give concepts form basically in a commercial environment. Um, and so I, I was very interested by that also as a designer, how do you give ideas or concepts form? Um, and how do you make that form something which can be understandable by other people? Uh, so, you know, I learned a lot from, from working in that. I learned a lot about modes of communication, tone of voice, institution building, uh, you know, each of the projects that I've been involved with, whether it's with, you know, the ICA in London or Serpentine or whether or Tate Modern or Britain, or whether it's with, you know, a huge corporation, um, there, there are always things that you can learn from the way that they structure themselves, the way that they conduct their business, the type of business that they do. You learn all sorts of specialist information. You know, we did a consultancy project with a huge uh, developer in London um, last year, they were very worried because they were losing just a colossal amount of money. And of course, as a result of that, and they wanted to know about what the future of housing was. So we were very happy to talk to them about that. Um, but as a consequence of that, suddenly you get uh, all of this commercial information about the true state of the British uh, housing situation from a developer's point of view. So I, I imagine that the work that I do in different fields is partly to do with a kind of training of myself, mm -hmm. trying to learn the skills that I think I need and uh, a kind of crowdsourcing of different skills. And on the other hand, I think of it as a type of commercial espionage where basically I want to find out about these fields and I want to find out what's really going on. Like I want to find out what is going on at Ikea? Like, is that company going to survive? Is it doing well? If so, why and how? Um, and there's no way to get that uh, information unless you work with them. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I realize that's a bit of a general answer, but hopefully that's helpful. But, um, but in terms of giving things form, um, one, of the, one of the things you've done is sometimes, and you know, I've heard you say this before, is to um, formalize architecture in a, in a form of book, for example. Yeah. Um, it's like if you can't build it, print it. Yeah. Um, and, and again, uh, a real review being a magazine. So I'm just kind of wondering the, rel mm. the relevance of, how do you see the relevance of the printed matter? Uh, yeah, I mean, today? I, I think that material objects are very important, uh, both as a kind of concrete record of what it is that you have been doing. Um, it's, it's very hard sometimes, especially when you're working as a freelancer or in a precarious environment, to actually point to anything that you have done because it exists as PDFs, it exists as websites, it exists as Instagram posts. It doesn't exist as a tangible thing. Uh, so for me, at least, I've, I've always been very interested in the physicality of objects and their meaning, um, whether that's in the domestic sphere or any other type of sphere. Uh, and I really insist on like looking at objects and understanding how they came to be and so on. So uh, publications then become a good way for me to kind of crystallize or manifest a lot of the things that, uh, uh, that I have been thinking about or working on. Um, and there are huge kind of design opportunities as well. The books and publications that I've worked on in the last five years, each one has, has also dealt with a specific topic, which has been uh, part of building up the knowledge set and the authority or expertise that I need to do real homes. So, you know, Mies in London was basically about why, how democracy and the planning system interact with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a book about Mies van der Rohe's only UK building, which was canceled due to a fight between 
uh, the creation of public space and how Thatcher and Prince Charles rejected this idea of creating new public space, uh, or they were anxious about the meaning of public space. Um, or, you know, real estate's uh, life without debt, which is all about financial models and the fi financial aspects uh, behind uh, contemporary production of architecture. Or symbolic exchange, which is about uh, community building and about sharing economy, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, the most recent one that we're working on at the moment is a translation of a book by uh, O.M. Ungers and Lisa Lotta Ungers called uh, Utopian Communes in the New World, 1740 to 1972. And it's a book about the history of American radical uh, communes, um, you know, the, the Quakers, the Shakers, uh, up to kind of hippie communes of the 1970s. Quite, quite directly feeds into your, um, what you're trying to do with your project, build project. 100%. And because, you know, as part of doing that translation in that book, I had to both research all of those groups that they mention uh, myself, but also it, it opened up an entire world of understanding why <clears throat> community design is successful or has failed over the last 400 years. Um, and <clears throat> that uh, that's very kind of directly ap applicable. But it also means that when you go to investors and they say, well, you know, what do you really know about any of this? You're like, well, we published a book about community design. We published a book about uh, how to innovate in the financial design of housing. We did a book about you know, the future of domestic life with home economics. Uh, we did a book about democracy, public space, and, and the planning program, uh, and aesthetics, and so on and so forth. And in the case of Real Review, uh, that is also uh, has other purposes. You know, one is that if you're trying to change people's relationship with, um, well, the answer as to why we make Real Review is very bluntly, it's a form of propaganda, uh, which is if you are trying to change the way that people relate to housing and relate to their everyday life, then it's not just a question of making a commercial product which everyone can buy and love. You also have to change the ideology and the mentality of society as a whole. Uh, so it's, it's not, you can't just make an economic argument. You also have to say like, this is a better way for us to live as a society. And in order to do that, you have to create an audience or uh, create a, an, an object which can change people's perspectives around issues of affordability, of uh, you know, the importance of social equality and so on. And most of all, give people a methodology that they can use in their own lives to start to be critical. So Real Review in its essence is a kind of materialist magazine. It takes things which exist already, often objects, uh, often spatial conditions, and it analyzes them and presents them to you in a way that you didn't expect or know, whether that's like looking at the history of lawns or the history of barbed wire, or it's a review of contactless technology, or it's a review of um, you know, low battery, what it means to have low battery and how, in fact, the need to manage a battery charge, in fact, completely reconfigures your mind into a kind of capitalist machine. Um, and the reason why it needs to be a physical object from, from, in my opinion, is quite simple as well, which is uh, that a printed object has an authority which a digital object does not have. Um, so it's important to be able to argue with some authority. Uh, but aside from that, the physical experience of reading print is very different from engaging with the digital uh, uh, idea of text. Uh, you know, Real Review is also designed as a space. It has a finite number of pages, which means that you have to make a priority about what is included and what is excluded. You can't edit it afterwards, so it becomes a record of its time. And most of all, you know, the, it's a relationship of autonomy and privacy and respect for the reader, which is, you know, we don't take metrics. We're not looking at clicks. We're not looking at how long you spend on a page. We don't know if you read an article or not, and it doesn't matter. Uh, it, you have total freedom in terms of your relationship with the text. And I think that absence of metrics is actually very important as well for uh, an idea of how people engage with, uh, as we were saying before, with the, with the public sphere. Um, so that's, that's why we do real review. Um, it's, it's a kind of counterpart, counterpart, a cultural counterpart to the Real Homes project.
Mm, I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, it's a model, a magazine is also a kind of model of creative practice of being, you know, it's uh, uh, because we end up, well, at least I do, I think probably you do too. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why we're having this conversation. But, um, you know, I feel there is a kind of an emerging generation or a, an emerging kind of, I guess, call it generation of people who operate on so many different levels and on so many different, um, in so many different kind of ways that it's hard to define what they actually are. And then they become pretty much a magazine. You know, you can only judge these people in the moment in time in which they operate and only in that one moment in time. So they're like a magazine, a bit of a cross section of cult culture at the point when you meet them. And then the next time you see them, they'll be different because, you know, they never get reprinted. They, as you just said, you know, magazines don't get reprinted, which is a real kind of beauty of it. It's a real artifact. So I'm just wondering whether that can kind of become almost a way of, um, you know, practicing. Um, I think that's definitely true. Uh, I get quite worried about that, actually, um, because uh, part of understanding myself is also understanding what I think I'm doing. Um, and so I do see a lot of people working in very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary ways or even non-disciplinary ways. I guess you would say in an undisciplined way. Uh, but the uh, part of the difficulty for those, and you know, one of the names that has to be applied to that is creative director because we don't really have another term for it, I think. Um, but the, uh, or kind of artist is often used as a very, very general term to, to cover uh, someone who's working in this way. Um, personally, I, I am an architect. I, I got my part three, which means I'm registered with uh, the architect's registry board. And I have the required insurance and skills to, to do that job. Um, and therefore I think of myself as an architect who is doing these other things. Uh, I don't want to make a reference to the kind of modernist period in which architects were like, I can design furniture, I can design cutlery, I can design textiles, I can run a magazine. But of course, I think there is a long history because that, that tends to become also part of the ego of the architect, which is that they can do anything uh, and better than anyone else in those fields. I, I have some humility around the fields that I work in. I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a furniture designer. I'm an architect who has designed uh, some furniture or who has worked on graphic uh, publications of graphic design. Um, uh, because I, I think each of those is an expert field and we have to, even if you work in it a lot, you have to be, I think, uh, respectful of people who are truly experts in those fields. Um, but yeah, so in that sense, I do think of myself as an architect and it's, uh, it's because that's where my primary passion is. It's because I think architecture is well, is, is the most sophisticated spatial practice. So if you're interested in space, I think architecture is, is the most sophisticated way we have to design space. Yeah. I, th I think the question for me is about, um, firstly, naming yourself, choosing any identity or choosing any label hmm. is more about how you relate to your own work and practice than it is necessarily to do with the rest of that practice. So but it also has to do with what your objectives are because there's some strategy as well to how you label yourself or how you name yourself. Um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, well, it can start to become quite complicated, but in a, in a straightforward way, I'm also concerned to call myself an architect because ultimately my project is to make very big buildings. And therefore if I, said to everyone that I'm a creative director or an artist, they would not want to put $25 million into something. Whereas an architect has a, a kind of professional quality to it. But at the same time, I would also say that like, uh, when I call myself an architect, what I think I'm doing is architecture, even though a lot of people would say that what I'm doing is not architecture. Uh, so in a way, it's also up to me to decide what I think architecture is and therefore whether or not what I'm doing is architecture. And I think in that sense, whether you call yourself an architect or an artist or any other type of uh, label, 
is about how you relate to yourself and your own work and what you want that profession or discipline to be as well. Uh, I think that's a very useful clarification. But what do you think about this notion that, um, you know, every creative field has a kind of different emphasis? emphasis. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know, I might not be right in, in uh, observing that art is far more um, identity centric than architecture is. But then at the same time, you are always quite interested in uh, are the kind of uh, persona of the architects. Um, yeah. I, I think there are some significant differences. I, I couldn't necessarily talk so much about who those figures are because there are a million different types of architect and there are maybe even more different types of artists. Uh, but so I, and I also can't tell you what it is that they make or do because there are also thousands and thousands of different types of architecture you know it can be a book i think it can be a design object i think it can be a building i think it can be all sorts of things i think sometimes architecture can be a written piece of text um mm. and the same for art uh it's it's very hard to say like this is art this isn't art it's you can't easily do that um which is also true of fashion or graphic design or anything else right like what what at the point and this is so much of the conceptual and experimental art of the 60s was like what even is a piece of music what is the limits of what a piece of music can be um so but what i can say is i think a little bit to do with the methodology or the approach of these different disciplines and practices because um, architecture by its nature, I mean, people talk about it as an artistic practice, but it's actually a scientific practice, um, not in an engineering sense, but in the sense that the idea of the project and the idea of design within architecture is that you start out with uh, an aim uh, and a hypothesis. So you have to do something, you know, design a house or write a text or whatever it might be. And you have a hypothesis about how to do it. Then you have to develop your own method. And then you have uh, the, which is the design process of producing something. And you must make a proposition in architecture. You cannot just critique uh, something. You have to produce an object of design, yeah. which then has consequences, which you can conclude and learn from and then implement into the next process. Whereas the field of art for me doesn't have to be a proposition. It can not in the same way as an architectural project. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can be also, um, I think a big difference is that architecture is only really successful for me when it is talking beyond an individual, um, when it is talking to a social condition and a, a collective condition art can often be highly personal and highly subjective and located around an individual's practice. Um, and those two things I think are very uh, important kind of differentiations. Um, but finally, in, in both cases, I think there's, there's what I would call an artistic spirit and an artistic spirit, as it was explained to me by an artist friend of mine, which I think is a fantastic description that she gave to it was basically to say the artist cannot help being an artist. There is no way that they could do anything else than what they're doing. You could not force them to do anything else. This is uh, the only way that they know how to be in the world. And certainly I feel an artistic spirit across many types of practice. I sometimes even come across the artistic spirit amongst lawyers or accountants where they are very deeply into what it is that they're doing in a way that they could not be any other way in the world one kind of question that I think is quite urgent. Uh, and it is to do with the uh, education, and I guess mm -hmm. especially architectural education. And you yourself teach, and you've said that uh, a lot of things you've done um, were basically a kind of, pro uh, a kind of a process of self-learning. -lear I don't wanna ask a kind of cliche question of where do you see uh, the architectural education going, but, but do, do you think, um, where, what do you think is the kind of ultimate purpose of the architectural education? Um, um, what I, my relationship with teaching is actually uh, very much, I think, the relationship that parents and children tend to have in a family, which is regardless of whether you got on well and had a good childhood or had a bad childhood and didn't get on well with your parents, Ultimately, if you choose to have a family, you will either choose to repeat 
uh, the upbringing that you had or make changes from it as a form of critique of your parents. Um, and so the way that teaching in architecture works is that every generation of teachers have the opportunity to, in a way, respond to the way that they were taught. And some people say that the way that they were taught is the right way. They're going to repeat that. It was fantastic. Let's keep it as it is. And others will say the times have changed and perhaps the things that we didn't think of as important in the past are now more important or less important. So um, in, in my case, one of the reasons that I teach is that uh, the types of subjects which are very important to me, um, which have to do with, on the one hand, these kind of social questions of social equality, uh, anti-racism, uh, and uh, uh, gender inequality uh, and discrimination uh, around uh, gender and sexuality. They're the kind of key things that I'm interested in and how to deconstruct uh, white privilege as well. These questions were never, there was no absolutely zero discussion in the time that I was at university, which is not, which is only, you know, 2004 to 2014. That's when I was studying which was a long time to be studying, I should add. But, um, and so it's extremely recent that it was impossible to uh, you know, really discuss these types of social issues. And most of all, there was no space, even at an experimental school like the Architectural Association, there was no space to understand not just the importance of these subjects, but how to give them form. Like, what can we do about this? How can we actually make a change in the world? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, one of the reasons that I teach is partly because it's incredibly inspiring to be surrounded every week by uh, you know, students who are motivated, engaged, who have personal practices, who have interests of their own, and in a way to support them uh, in, in their own uh, journey. Uh, I find that, uh, and especially in a non-commercial environment, because although technically I'm paid to do that job, it is not the same as working in a company when you work with a student. Mm -hmm. There is a, a completely um, uh, non-commercial uh, environment of the academy, which is important to preserve. It's, you're, you're not concerned about whether or not this is a financially profitable project that they're working on. Uh, and that's very liberating. And of course, the other aspect is in order to raise the subjects and in order to try and push forward and develop methodologies for how we will address these questions in society. Uh, so at least for me, the future of, of architectural education, at least, is to understand architectural practice in a broader scope. It's not just about making buildings, working late hours, drinking lots of coffee, having no private life, having uh, you know, this kind of constant self-exploitation. It really has to be um, a kind of cultural shift within the profession and the discipline, which starts within the university. And so I'm interested in being part of the university so that I can influence that next generation of architectural employees who will not accept 